So you've probably heard and seen the big news media outlets throw around terms such as gas guzzling SUVs, fuel thirsty giants, rugged cars, keeping up with the Joneses, bigger cars, fuel thirsty SUVs and so on. Well, there's three myths which I want to dispel. Now the most recent round of articles moaning about SUVs has come out because the top 10 cars in Australia for 2023 were all SUVs or utes. And I've placed them all here as you can see. The orange ones are four wheel drives and the purple ones are SUVs. And there's actually one electric vehicle in there, the Tesla Model Y, but you don't tend to see that reported a whole lot. So that's the latest impetus. Now, let's take a look at that data. But we're going to start with shoes. I think you'll agree that all of these items are in fact shoes, trainers, high heels, various types of boots, etc. But are they comparable? Well, no, we've got three different types of boots here, yet they are also shoes. I'd also argue that a hiking boot is not comparable to an RM Williams dress shoe, and that is not comparable to the high heel or the thong or anything else. So yes, they're all shoes, but they're actually all quite different. And the same is also true of these vehicles here, which are all potentially classified as SUVs or even utes. They're different because these are four wheel drives at the same point as being SUVs, yet you cannot compare the two. And the FCAI, I think, do the industry a disservice by calling all of these vehicles SUVs, where in fact they should be splitting it down according to purpose a little bit further. Now, of course, the four by fours, they are designed for off-roading and towing, and they have capabilities which the SUVs, which in effect simply road cars, do not have, and that is why they are not comparable. These have higher clearance, they can tow more, they have different design features to meet that criteria. 4x4 drive range, drivetrains, often low range, full-size spare even, typically with these vehicles. These ones have a space saver spare. The, the list of differences goes on because they have different capabilities. So you really got to compare like with like. So we can't have, for example, the i30, well, we can have the i30N comparing with the Hyundai Kona. I think that's a reasonable comparison because they're both designed as suburban cars. You can't compare the i30 with the Nissan Patrol and you can take a Camry and you can compare that reasonably to a RAV4 because both of them could conceivably do the same job um, and a Camry against a Prado doesn't work. So comparably, these two have pretty much the same safety, the same features, the same price, they're comparable, but not when you come to the 4x4. Let's take a look at some actual specifications to see what sort of differences exist between a road car SUV and a road car. We'll start with the i30N. That's the length, that's the width, that's the height, that's the range of weights, and there's a range of weights because that will vary depending on the trim model, automatic or manual transmission, and also the engine type. Um, and here's the fuel consumption, which which again varies for those same reasons. Now if we compare that to the Tucson, now um, the Tucson comes in two wheel drive and all wheel drive. I've used a range of both figures here for that. Uh, we can see that the weight here is 1428, 1560, so it is heavier, um, and the fuel consumption is there or thereabouts. Now, that's interesting because the fuel consumption is not really massively greater. In fact, there's an overlap with the i30N, so why is that? Well, there's a couple of um, reasons. One is that it could be a newer engine, it could be a uh, newer transmission. Um, it's not directly comparable in that way. And also, weight, when you're in cruise, weight doesn't make a huge amount of, of difference. Weight makes a difference when you're going up hills and accelerating. What makes a difference when you're in cruise, in fact, um, at higher speeds, is aerodynamic efficiency. But again, the Tucson should be behind the i30 there because it has more drag, because it has a larger frontal area, because it is taller. But the biggest difference between the two is the dimensions. You can see this is 4.3 metres long. That's 4.6 metres long, which is a reasonable amount. And it's also a bit wider wider as well. So why don't we take a look at the Kona then. So this is 4.3 metres, again 4.3 metres, so exactly the same length. The Kona is a little bit wider, so it 
um, just a fraction wider and obviously a bit taller as well. Um, and it is heavier, but again, there's an overlap with the i30. Um, and the fuel consumption is actually lower. Now, this could be a generational thing. This is the brand new um, Kona, whereas that i30N has been around a, a, bit long, a bit longer, but it does show that there's not necessarily a massive difference, not, not gas guzzling, certainly. Then if we look at the Toyota Corolla, which has almost exactly the same dimensions as the um, i30N and pretty close to the same weight range, Toyota only give one weight range because of the specs there. Um, let's compare that to the RAV4. And the RAV4, again, roughly comparable fuel consumption, but it's bigger. So 4.3 meters here, the RAV4 is 4.6 um, meters meters long and it is significantly heavier but that's not really playing out hugely for fuel consumption. Now if we look at the Camry, the Camry is longer again than the RAV4 um, and um, it is a tiny bit narrower and of course it is not as tall. Um, 1500 kilos, again that's showing that the SUVs are a little bit heavier but the fuel consumption 6.8 that's well towards the high end of what the um, RAV, RAV4 does. Now I'm excluding from here um, hybrids and diesel because they're not all available across all of these. It's just purely the petrol, both automatic and manual, and front-wheel drive and all-wheel drive. If you've got a front-wheel drive vehicle, that will be a little bit lighter than an all-wheel drive, and it should use a little bit less fuel because of that, and also because of less driveline friction. But I think what this is showing us is that SUVs and all-wheel drives are the same width and the length, um, and uh, they are taller, they're slightly heavier, and there will be slightly greater fuel consumption. But in practice, I don't really see how you can call these gas guzzlers because the figures are just so comparable and so close. Now, there's also a massive variation in size. I mean, um, this is a high end venue, 1200 kilograms. There's a Suzuki Jimny, capable off road at 1100 kilograms or less, all the way up to big vehicles like these, which are 2800. So, again, SUV encompasses all of them. What type of SUV are you comparing? Now, there's another myth, which is that these um, vehicles are bought for the looks. Now, I can imagine that if you bought a 76, a Grenadier, or a Jimny, you might want to buy a vehicle which is tough and or appears tough and gives you that outback look. And so I, I, can, I can see how these vehicles would be bought for that. Now, to my knowledge, nobody's bought a Grenadier purely for its looks. I know people have bought Jimnys purely for their looks. The 76, well, probably the less said about that, um, the better. These vehicles. Does anyone seriously think that looking at your neighbour who's got an MG ZS parked in their driveway, you're going to think, oh, yeah, they're a bit rough and tough. They're into the camping. I bet they're across, going across to Simpson next week. Or you look over to the other neighbour and they've got a Kona um, or a Tucson parked in their drive when you think, oh, I bet they've just come back from the Victorian high country or they've just been cruising through sand dunes. You, you do not buy these cars for a tough look. That's just literally nonsensical and if, if it, it doesn't stack up to me at all that people would buy these for the look. If you think different and you've got any evidence to support it please put it in the comments. Now I am basing this um, off my own anecdotal evidence, I get asked about these questions all the time, and chats with various product planners, PR people, engineers from car companies, some coming from nothing but I don't have a report to prove it all. Now, why do people buy SUVs? And again, this is what I'm coming off all, all, all of that research that I've done there. So one, the thing that I'm told most often is people like the high, higher seating position. They get a perceived sense of improved safety. Um, it's comfortable because you can get in and out more easily. If you've got young children like babies, you can lift them in and out of the car. If you've got older parents or people who are in the firm, they can get in and out of the SUV more easily as opposed to lower. And there's also a um, perceived safety. Time and time again I said, so why did you buy this, this car? Oh, it just feels safer when I'm next to a truck on the freeway. That is the answer people give you. Now, whether that's right or wrong, we could do another video on, on that, but that is a, a driver. And the third one is clearances. Now, whilst I've said people don't buy these SUVs, these road-going SUVs for off-roading, there are times when clearances is handy. So I was at a beach house um, the other, um, over the weekend, and one of the jobs there was to hook up a six by four trail and do some clearing and so on. Well, the four wheel drive we had it connected to needed to engage four wheel drive to get up this last 10 meters um, of, of the bush block. And that's the sort of stuff which an SUV is handy for and also a rutted driveway here and stuff like that. It just removes the, the worry about a little bit of rough terrain here, even if you never intend to go off road. 
So those are the reasons why. And there's also no real disadvantage. You're not going to pay more for an SUV compared, or road going SUV compared to the equivalent road car. It's not going to be less safe. It's not going to be um, handled worse. You know, there's no real disadvantage. We're not comparing a Land Cruiser 76 with a Camry here. We're comparing two like for like vehicles. Now there is one vehicle which should be way more popular than it is and it hasn't ever been popular and it won't ever be popular but logic says it should be popular and it is of course the people mover. Nobody wants a people mover because it's just a bad image yet they are supremely practical. You can put lots of stuff in there. They're relatively fuel efficient for their size. They can take lots of people, lots of stuff. Um, they're no real bigger than a road car in terms of width and height and uh, length same as an SUV they are taller why do people not love these more tell me in the comments um, the only objection I can think of is that you've got this forward control so the ride isn't quite as good as it is on a road car apart from that I can't really think of a reason why more people shouldn't be buying them so summarise then, so do not compare hiking boots with trainers if you work for a large news corporation. Um, like for like, there is no real difference between the SUV and the road car. Safety, fuel efficiency, handling, there is really no difference whatsoever. But people like SUVs for the reasons that I've listed. Um, and nobody buys an SUV road car for the looks, they just don't do it. Um, and I think people maybe should be more popular. So tell me what you think of this video in the comments. If you've bought a people mover or haven't, I'd like to know why. And if you have bought an SUV road car, why have you bought it and not a normal road car? Please let me know. Let's get that discussion started. Thank you for watching.